Uh, we're going to start the day with uh, four invited talks. And one of the reasons I'm excited about this session is that there are four talks on extremely diverse topics. Uh, from visually solving the classic uh, cocktail party problem, then to light sensitive displays, uh, then going on to deep tissue imaging, and then finally cell phone imaging of biobehaviors. Uh, so sounds very exciting to me. Uh, so the first talk is going to be by Tali Dekel from Google, and uh, she's going to talk about uh, the cocktail problem. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Tali Dekel. I'm a research scientist in Bill Freeman's group in uh, Google Cambridge. Uh, so unfortunately, Bill couldn't be here today and I'll present this uh, exciting work on his behalf. Um, so just to give you a bit of a background, uh, this is our Google group. Uh, it started about three years ago, uh, right across the street from MIT. Um, in fact, many of us joined from MIT or were uh, former students of Bill. And we are doing research at the intersection of vision, graphics, and machine learning. So today, I'm going to show you some cool new work that we have, uh, and it's going to appear in Seagraph uh, this summer. Uh, it's an audiovisual work. We call it Looking to Listen. And the goal is to deal with these case types of cases where we have many people talking at the same time, uh, but we are interested in only hearing one or some of them. Um, and you know, humans can do it very well. It is typically referred to as the cocktail party effect. Um, so we know how to focus our intention, attention on a specific speaker, um, but we want computers or machines like this Google Home device to be able to do that as well. And the reason we call it looking to listen is because the main idea is that we want to take advantage of the video to help us process the audio. Uh, so we want to look at the correlations between the audio signals and, say, the face movements and utilize it to, separate, to better separate the speech. Um, so the input to our algorithm is a video uh, with people speaking over each other uh, or speaking in a noisy place. And basically what we want is to let you click on the face of the person that you want to hear and hear only that person while everything else is muted. Um, so here is an example. Uh, this is a sport panel, typical sport panel where people talking over each other. He's not on a Danny Ainge level, but Don't he's above a Colangelo now. level. In other words, he Don't understands enough to... If I you said, you said it was all right fan. to lose on purpose. You said it's all right to if, lose yeah, on purpose yeah, of course and it advertise it's that to the fans. Who doesn't it's know perfectly that? perfectly okay. Okay, so now we can use our uh, method to hear just the speaker on the left. Don't explain it away now. Don't explain it away. You said you said it was all right to lose on purpose. You said it's all right to lose on purpose and advertise that to the fence. It's perfectly okay. And we can do the same and play only the speaker on the right. He's not on a Danny Ainge level, but he's above a Colangelo level. In other words, he understands enough to... If I were a Sixers fan, if... Yeah, yeah, of course it is. It's called tanking. Who doesn't know that? Okay, so uh, again, P Bill couldn't be here today, so I thought we can at least hear how uh, he describes what we are doing. Okay, so the task is, um, given the video, any person who you see talking, their audio gets cleaned up and everything else gets suppressed. And now we can even hear him better if we remove all the background noise. Okay, so the task is, um, given the video, any person who you see talking, their audio gets cleaned up and everything else gets suppressed. And this is just another example for fun. This is a video from the Conan O'Brien show where they basically accidentally booked two comedians to perform, to perform on the same slot. But luckily they did, so they acted together. And this is how they input video. I'm not a fan of flying. I hate it. I hate being he on the plane. Because he might say, in general, my so are many noises. Solid. You know what I mean? I won't flush the and toilet say, oh, on an airplane because of the noise. Zero. Like, it scares me. And again, here is our result separating the speech and for only the right speaker. I'm not a fan of flying. I hate it. I hate being on planes. 
in general, there's so many noises. You know what I mean? I won't flush the toilet on an airplane because of the noise. Like, it scares me. You go, you hit flush, then you turn around, nothing happens for five seconds. Then out of nowhere, boo! Boo! Oh, my God! I just put a hole in the plane. And as a comparison, uh, this is what you get with the state-of-the-art method uh, for s uh, speed separation that is uh, using only audio. You go, you hit flush, then you turn around, but it happens for five seconds. Then out of nowhere, so we can see two, two main advantages of using uh, video in addition to audio. Uh, first of all, we get better quality, especially when people are speaking over each other. Uh, also, when we are using video, we get the association between the separated audio tracks with the speaker uh, in the videos. And for that, by definition, we need the video frames. In the audio-only case, even if the speech is well separated, you still need to match the separated tracks to the speakers in the video. Um, in terms of related work, so uh, there's been some previous earlier work on audiovisual source separation, but results weren't great until two weeks ago. Um, so basically now there are four papers. Ours is one of them, and the others from Berkeley, MIT, and Oxford all showing pretty compelling results on uh, source separation. Uh, we actually found out that we are working on similar topics and being friends, we decided to basically release the papers together. Uh, um, so it's all very fresh and I'm not gonna go into uh, a comparison here, but I just wanted to mention those papers and so you will know that there are other works that is also discovered the power of audiovisual processing. Um, but this is what we do. Uh, we train the neural network, of course, uh, and we took a supervised approach. Um, to do that, what we need, we need the input to be a natural mixed speech video, and we need also the ground truth of the separated voices for each of the speakers to train this network. Um, and of course, finding lots of natural videos with overlapping speech and ground truth is very challenging. Um, but what we can do is uh, automatically detect videos where we have single speakers uh, with clean speech and then mix them together. So this is how we started putting this data set together. We crawled about 100K uh, educational videos from YouTube, videos of lectures, how-to videos, and so on. Um, and we chose educational videos because in general uh, they contain like a single speaker, you get a nice view of the face, the video quality is uh, pretty good, uh, the, audio, the audio quality is pretty good as well, and here is a short segment from such a video. It doesn't use radars like potential autonomous cars. Actually, in order to navigate, it only uses a vision system. So we get a nice view of the face and a clean speech, which uh, is what we need. Um, of course, there are still many segments of, in, in these types of videos that we don't want to use. So, for example, we may have clean speech, but not enough resolution of the face uh, because the person is too distant. Um, we could have a person talking over slides. Uh, so we basically use face tracking and audio processing to filter out these types of segments uh, automatically. Um, and after this filtering process, we are left only with segments uh, from the video that has clean speak and a visible uh, single speaker, uh, like in these examples. Drink clean water and breathe fresh air. We work with people of all ages and all backgrounds. The reason one would select a pin light over the other types of lighting. Uh, and this is essentially the, the data set we build. Uh, overall, we got around 1,500 hours of such clean segments, uh, single speaker talking, good view. We have around 100K different speakers um, talking in different languages, having different head motions and lighting and so on. So it's a very big and diverse data set. Um, and now, once we have this data set, we can start creating synthetic uh, cocktail parties. 
Uh, so for example, these two, um, two speaker party here. Defense mechanism, we tend to go out of our way to avoid them. And who within three years has halved that Defense mechanism, we tend to go out of our way to avoid them. That... And we can also add some background noise uh, to teach the model to also separate these types of sounds. Defense mechanism, we tend to go out of our way to avoid them. That... And of course, you could get as complex as you want by mixing more speakers, like this three party. Some students enrolled in a PhD in Europe. All the data human has generated started. Some students enrolled in a PhD in Europe. Okay, so now that we have generated data, we are ready to train our audiovisual model, uh, and we care only about the face region. So we start with detecting and tracking faces in the video, and then we use a pre-trained face recognition system to compute the face embedding for each of these uh, face thumbnails. So we basically take each face crop, fit it into the recognition network, and extract uh, a feature from the lowest layer of the network. So we basically have face embeddings over time for each of the detected faces in the video. Uh, we did try working directly with raw pixels, uh, but we basically found that uh, working with these face embeddings uh, is better. And this is supported by another uh, work from our group that showed that it is possible to synthesize faces using the same embeddings as the only input to the network. Uh, so these embeddings, they capture in a lot of information about, uh, about the face while being very robust to all sorts of variations like lighting and occlusions and, and stuff. So it, it's a very useful representation and this is basically the representation we use. From this point, we can forget about the frames. Um, for the audio, we use a complex spectrogram and these all go into our audiovisual source separation model. I'm going to talk about it in more details in a, in a minute. Um, the output of this model is essentially a complex mask for each of the speakers. So it's a float number uh, between 0 to 1 that we multiply uh, by the uh, input noisy spectrogram and invert back to time to get the clean waveforms for each of the speakers. So going a bit deeper uh, into the network, the face embeddings of each of the speakers, they, they first go through a, a visual stream. And you can see here that uh, the weights are shared between the speakers, so we are not increasing the number of parameters uh, with increasing the number uh, of speakers uh, in the model. Um, the spectrogram is pushed through a different separated audio stream. But the architecture for both audio and visual stream is quite similar. It's basically a bunch of uh, dilated convolutions. Uh, for, the, for the visual stream, the convolutions operate on the time domain. And in the audio stream, the convolutions operate on the time frequency domain. Um, the output of these streams are then fused. And we then jointly process them. We use bidirectional LSTM that allow us to better uh, capture corre correlation over time and several fully connected layers. Um, so as I mentioned, the output is a complex mask per speaker that is multiplied by the input noisy spectrogram and inverted back to time to get the clean uh, speech track for, for each of the uh, speakers. Um, and we train this model using our uh, data set uh, with an L2 loss between the ground truth spectrogram and the output spectrogram from the model. So just to flash some uh, numbers, the network has around 19 million parameters. We train it uh, with 1.5, around 1.5 million uh, mixed pitch segments, like each segment has is a three second segment. Uh, and processing time, uh, just like feed forwarding one example in the network is around um, 10x real time at this point. Um, so it's a, big, it's a big network or a medium, I don't know. What is considered big these days? Um, but um, so let's see some more results. Uh, this is Ariel, our intern uh, that worked on this project from Israel. Hi guys. 
So we've been trying to train this network to input two embeddings and output three. Yeah, this is just an extra experiment for the paper. Um, and now let's uh, remove the, the background noises. Hi, guys. So we've been trying to train this network to input two embeddings and output three. Yeah, this is just an extra experiment for the paper. And I guess you may think that uh, the reason that it works so well is because the network can utilize, I don't know, differences in pitch or so on, some cues. So we wanted to make it harder. So this is our double Sundar example. Sundar is Google CEO. Um, and we basically took two different parts of the same video, um, time shifted them, and placed them side by side. So we have the same speaker, same voice. Everything is the same, just time delayed. So this is the input video. For example, thinking, I use Google Calendar all the time. Work. On Sundays, at a higher I try level, to get a weekly view of how my week world. looks like. Now let's speak only the left Sundar. At a higher level, in an AI-first world, I believe computers should adapt to how people live their lives, rather than people having to adapt to computers. And this is an extremely challenging case for an audio-only model, and this is what you get from a state-of-the-art audio-only model. At a higher level, in the AI-first world, I believe computers should be adapt to how people live their lives, to get a view into the world, our and our results again. At a higher level, in an AI-first world, I believe computers should adapt to how people live their lives, rather than people having to adapt to computers. Um, in terms of numbers, we have a large data set with ground, with ground truth. So we created like cocktail parties mixtures with different numbers of speakers. And we measured the SDR for the audio-only model and our model. And we used our model under a different numbers, uh, number of input visual stream. Uh, so you can see the number here. I'll just point out uh, two, two things. First of all, when we have just a single speaker with background noise, you can see that the visual component is not doing much. Um, it's basically, we are in par with the audio-only uh, model. But when we start introducing uh, overlap in speech, that's where our model shines with an average improvement of 1.5 dB. Uh, we also measured how well do we do with separating speech of the same gender, and you can see from these numbers that we're pretty robust to gender. Um, okay, so going back to natural scenarios, here is in bar from our team trying to get directions from a phone while her kids screaming in the backseat. Okay, Google, please navigate to work. Okay, Google. So for me, this was, I guess, the most impressive results because our model managed to do what I can ever do, quiet the kids. So let's see that. Okay, Google, please navigate to work. Okay, Google. Uh, we can also use our model to improve, uh, to pro to improve automatic uh, speech recognition. So here we used YouTube. Um, YouTube has an automatic system to produce captions for every video that is uploaded. So uh, we uploaded one of our examples, and I'm going to play so you can pay attention to the caption on the top, and you can notice uh, the errors. What do you want him to do? Have you read the testimony? I, don't need to, I, I talked to the Department of Justice at length about this. Have they got you an injunction the against the guy that no, was given Megan, to the U.S. It, Commission on it, Civil Rights. It doesn't. It doesn't matter. They got so an injunction no, against him. No, but they got an you don't injunction know what you're against about. him. You clearly don't yes, know I what do. you're talking about. They so clearly, captions are messed up when there is uh, speech overlap. Uh, so what we did, we used our audiovisual enhancement as a pre-processing. Uh, we basically muted the speaker on the left and then upload it to YouTube, and now the caption makes much more sense. What do you want them to do? I don't need to, I, I talked to the Department of Justice at length about this. They got an injunction against the guy. No, Megan, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't matter. They got an injunction against him. No, but they got an injunction against him. Okay, so we have a complicated system with millions of parameters that has you know, magic, so that's great, but we wanted to, to at least understand better uh, what's the job of the visual component. So we, fo we followed the standard methodology. We 
place this uh, 11 by 11 by 200 millisecond occluder. Uh, this is a space-time occluder. And each time we occluded a different patch in that uh, video, we fit for that in the network, and we measured how, uh, how the separation result changes with and without the occluder. And that gives us uh, a heat map video where red corresponds to regions that contribute much to the separation result. I won't answer my question. Polling station, Kirsten, because Why won't you answer my question? What's your question? Uh, and these are some more sampled frames from other videos that we applied this visualization on. And what we can see consistently is that regions around the mouth contributing a lot to the separation result, but not only, also regions around the eye and cheeks. Um, and I will finish with uh, one last example. I wanted to like stretch a little bit like to let you uh, guys understand better the envelope of like what the model could handle. So this is an extreme source separation result. It's a very low SNR. And you know how in research you always run experiments on your family. So this is Omri, my husband, uh, uh, on a date night in a noisy bar. <laughs> And this is the separation uh, result. Hi, can you order? No, that's it's fine. Uh, I'd have the single patch, please. And she wanted the, the Cabernet, the Venetia. So again, it's not perfect, but this is a very uh, low SNR and still managed to mute the bartender, which is nice. Um, so looking forward, uh, we think that this technology could be useful for a bunch of applications in Google, but not only, uh, as I mentioned, improving auto captioning, improving uh, video conferencing, being used in uh, home assistant devices. And uh, a moonshot would be to integrate something like this to improve audiovisual hearing aids. Um, so thank you all, and I hope you enjoyed the talk. Time for a few questions. It's not a. It's all single microphone. We haven't compared to informing results. Yeah. Right, so uh, we, we only focused on speech here, so not like musical instruments. Actually, one of the papers that I mentioned as a really recent work, they focused on music um, um, to basically let you click on some pixels and hear the instruments that play that music. If our model Destroy the pitch, that's the question, or? Does it uh, take, uh, correctly reproduce the frequency of the signal? Right, so um, these results support that. Also, the fact that we have numerical evaluation supports that. Um, I guess uh, one key point to do that was that we used a complex spectrogram, so we didn't have to worry about phase, uh, because we basically reconstruct the phase together with the signal, so that was important to achieve that. Right, so this is a, a good question. So we have the freedom to train our model with different number uh, of input streams and uh, we could have a different configuration of the models to, to, train, uh, uh, to train this. Um, so we don't need to, but some configuration might wor work better. So if you want to deal with three, three uh, people speaking at the same time, you may want to train the model this way.
Yes. It Yes, it works pretty well. So in some of the language uh, videos here, actually, we had some Hebrew in the background. I don't know if you noticed, but uh, it works pretty well. It generalizes pretty well across languages. Uh, the, the majority of the data set is English, but also has some examples from other languages as well. One last question from there. Yes, I mean, there are a bunch of other audiovisual applications uh, that we are exploring. Lip reading, I think it's, uh, uh, I would consider it to be a much more challenging problem than the enhancement, but I think it's definitely worth the exploration. Um, yeah. Great, let's uh, thank the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I want to tell you today about some, of, some uh, some a set of papers that we had in the last year uh, trying to develop light-sensitive displays. So the displays that we have today are very limited. And when I say limited, if you look at this uh, uh, screen, so it's a 2D screen and you see a 2D image, but actually what you see, you have there is a 3D scene, but still uh, when you move your head around, you don't get to see different viewpoints or different parallax. So there have been some attempts to develop a 3D screen, so uh, when you move your head you see some 3D parallax, and that's great, and it really adds to our viewer experience, but viewpoint sensitivity is only one part of, uh, of viewer experience, and another uh, not less important thing is uh, light sensitivity. And when I say light sensitivity, so if you look at this image, uh, you kind of get the impression that the illumination uh, was coming from below because all the shadows are uh, on top of the objects. And maybe in this uh, room uh, you have illumination on the top, so maybe the image should look like that. Uh, so when I say a light sensitive display, um, I mean a, a display that will, will adapt the content and match the illumination and highlights according to the illumination uh, uh, around the viewer. Uh, and I think it's a very important uh, part of your experience. For example, if you have a mirror in the scene, then maybe you want to see a reflection of yourself in the image. Uh, so uh, the pioneering attempt to develop a light-sensitive display uh, was introduced by Shri uh, more than 10 years ago. And this was an active approach. And when I say active, uh, I mean that uh, they had the camera at the top of the display. You can see that they had a camera. And that camera sends the illumination in the room. And then they re-rendered the content of the, content of the scene according to the target illumination. So this uh, is really nice, and there's also attempt to extend it to, to higher dimensions. Uh, but the main problem is that uh, uh, it, it requires a lot of computation because you have to re-render the scene uh, on the fly. And also the response, is not, uh, the response to change in illumination are, no, are not instantaneous. Uh, in contrast, our goal here is to develop a passive display. And when I say a passive display, the display does not have any back illumination of its own, and also it doesn't have a camera sensing the illumination. So it only works by reflecting the, the actual illumination that you have in the, scattering the illumination that you have in the viewer environment in two different directions. And it does not sense the illumination, it does not know what the illumination is around, uh, but it really has optical components, mirrors and uh, lenses, which actually reflect the light and uh, that you have around you and spread it in the right way. And one, uh, uh, so first it uh, requires much less uh, power and also uh, it, uh, the response to illumination change really happens at the speed of light. Uh, so the main challenge in uh, developing such a display is that it's really, is a, it's really the high dimensionality of the problem. So suppose that uh, you want to account for every uh, possible illumination. So essentially you have a 4D light field of incoming illumination because every spatial, so you have a 2D screen and in every spatial point on the screen, you have two degrees of freedom of all possible illumination directions. So that's 4D for illumination and you also have four degrees of freedom of outgoing directions. Uh, so overall, you have eight degrees of freedom that this display should support. So that's really a very high dimension. Uh, and that's what makes the problem so hard. So uh, to make a long story short, we didn't really solve this problem, and we don't have, really have a display which does all of what I promise. Uh, but uh, we tried to focus on some simpler sub-problems uh, sub of, uh, of, uh, of this bigger uh, challenge. 
So I'll show, show you two types of display. Uh, the first one uh, has to do with uh, spatially, uh, is a spatially varying BRDF display. So what's a spatially varying BRDF? So here is a picture of a, of a spatial uh, device that we've created uh, using photolithography. So that's a very spatial uh, uh, piece. Uh, what's special about it is that uh, on every point on it, we have designed a different BRDF. So if I look at the, these two points, we have designed, uh, designed them such that they reflect light in a, given, in a different way that we have defined. So what you see here is a, for a given illumination direction, how, how much light is reflected to our, to our different uh, viewer, uh, viewer directions. So you, for example, you see that one point is more diffuse and the other one is more shiny because uh, in one case uh, the spread is wide and in the other case uh, the, spread, the light goes only in a certain uh, narrow range of angles. Now to really describe a BRDF, I need to tell you uh, how much light is spread for every different illumination direction. Uh, in practice, the BRDF is another way to simplify the problem and reduce the dimensionality. Uh, the BRDF that we considered here are only two-dimensional BRDFs in the sense that they are only a function of the half vector. They are only a function of the, the lighting and the sum of the lighting and viewing directions. It's not an independent uh, function of both lighting and viewing direction. So that's another way to reduce the complexity of the problem. So we had two types of such displays. The first one is not really a display, but it's a hardware piece that we created using micro, uh, micro lithography. And the second one is really a computer controlled display. So in the first case, what we did is to etch uh, with micro photolithography very, very small features uh, on the silicon wafer. And in the second case, we had uh, a spatial light modulator, which is actually a liquid crystal display where every pixel of it uh, can, have a, can have a different uh, index of refraction. You can computer cont uh, program and computer control the index of refraction of each pixel. And the pixels here are much, much smaller than what you can see in your eyes. They are uh, eight micron wide for the SLM and uh, two micron wide for the, for the wafer. It's much smaller than what you can actually see with your eye. And with your eye, you actually end up seeing an aggregation of several such pixels. And that's what gives you the power because uh, essentially what you do is to create a diffraction, design a diffraction pattern to display on uh, this collection of pixels such that the diffraction from this... Uh, set of pixels will uh, create, scatter the light and generate uh, the desired BRDF behavior. So let me show you what you can do with such a display. Uh, so for example, uh, here we had two target BRDFs. There are two types of anisotropic BRDFs. The red one uh, means that uh, you get bright, uh, bright reflectance when the illumination varies uh, uh, horizontally, and in the blue one, uh, you get a bright reflectance when the illumination varies vertically. And uh, we assign, uh, assign each of these two BRDF to different dots on the display. Uh, so now here we image the display when the illumination is coming from uh, the top. So in this case, the blue pixels are bright and the red pixels are dark. And so you get to see the main, the main is bright. And you can actually swap uh, the illumination direction and then you see the opposite of this optical illusion. And now the woman is bright and the, the man is dark. So uh, you achieve this by playing with two anisotropic BRDFs. Uh, now you can also uh, use this display to, to, gener uh, to display 3D effects. So for example, uh, you display some pattern and here is a picture of it from one viewpoint. And if you change your viewpoint, you can actually see a, uh, is it playing? So you can if you change your viewpoint, you can actually see free, uh, 3D effects. You can see parallax. And, Note that these are different images of the display from different viewpoints, but we did not change the patterns that we actually uh, present on the display. Uh, so just to keep track, I show here uh, the lighting and the viewing direction. So this is from a fixed lighting direction. Another thing you can do if you fix the, uh, the viewing direction, uh, you can change the, light, uh, you, uh, change the illumination and make it such that uh, it reacts to illumination direction uh, so the shadows and the highlight change in a realistic uh, way when you change the illumination direction. Now, uh, these are two different modes of the display, and in one of them we assumed that the uh, viewing is no that the illumination in your is known and we fixed the uh, we varied the viewing direction, and in the other one uh, we assumed that the viewpoint is fixed and uh, we made it sensitive to illumination, but we couldn't do both of them simultaneously. That will be the goal of the next uh, part of the talk. 
Uh, now, this is a dynamic display, so we can also uh, play a, a, movie of a, movie, a video of a moving horse, and uh, the highlights are changing in real time uh, throughout the, the, uh, the horse movement. Uh, another thing we can do in, with this display is to solve an argument about which channel to watch on TV. So we have two viewers sitting in two different directions, and we play a different... Uh, a different video to each uh, viewer, to each direction, and both viewers are happy. By the way, uh, uh, excuse me for this uh, awful uh, green artifact that some, something that happens when you change, uh, when you get a new laptop and you transfer your videos, and I have no idea how to solve it. Uh, okay, so there's a question of how to design, actually design uh, the display to, to do that. I won't get into the details since this is a very limited talk. I'll only tell you that uh, the features here are very small and essentially you have to account for wave effects to actually design what's going on here and essentially we, in, every small, in every small point that you see you have an aggregation of uh, much smaller features and you have to design a diffraction pattern that, uh, 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 that will reflect the light uh, in the, scatter the light in the way that you want it to. Uh, to actually do it correctly, we have to account for wave effects, but uh, if you really want to do it with wave optics tools, then uh, it results in a very complex and nonlinear optimization. And what was nice about what we did is that uh, we managed to uh, initialize it using geometric optics tool, uh, essentially use micro facet theory, and you have to derive exactly what are the uh, resolution and range and the uh, smoothness requirements for it to work, but uh, it really simplified the optimization problem. Uh, so I, I should, uh, uh, before I move to the next part, I should just be honest and say that this is, these are very small uh, displays and they had uh, lots of limitation. And the main, reason, uh, the main limitation had to do with the fact that the pitch of the features that you can generate on the display limits the angular range from which you can view or illuminate the display. Uh, so in the, with the micro, micro lithography, we can add uh, two micron features. With the SLM, it, they're even bigger, they're only eight micron. And that limits the angular range uh, for the micro lithography for 20 degrees. For the SLM, it was uh, really a narrow range of five degrees. Uh, the resolution is good, but uh, uh, the display is not that big. Uh, I mean, the SLM is only like 1.6, but 0 0.8 centimeters wide. It's really a tiny display. Uh, I should say that at this point, it's really just a proof of concept and not something that you can realistically hope to use. Um, Okay, so so far the display that I considered had, uh, remember that the big problem had eight degree of, degrees of freedom, that had, had only four degrees of freedom because we had a planar display, so two degrees of freedom for spatial position, and in each spatial position we had a BRDF which had two degrees of freedom, so that's 4D in general. And we could also use it uh, to display uh, 3D surfaces, but uh, this, we had 3D surfaces, so we could, could either, uh, either had a, uh, viewpoint sensitivity from a fixed illumination direction or illumination sensitivity from a fixed viewing direction, but we couldn't do both. So our goal in the, uh, in the next part was uh, actually to, to get both light, lighting and viewpoint sensitivity for 3D surfaces with the same display. Uh, so as I already started by saying that uh, in general that's an 8D problem, but uh, to make it uh, to work we had to reduce the dimensionality of the problem and we made se uh, se many simplifying assumptions. So first of all, uh, we have assumed that uh, the target is smooth and it's opaque, there are no interreflection, there are no subscattering uh, effects. Uh, the BRDFs were 2D, that's uh, the simpler assumption. And also we assume that there are no uh, self-occlusions uh, or cast shadows. So under these assumptions, uh, we actually reduced the problem to, into a 5D sub-manifold. So why 5D? You had a 2D screen, in every point you have one degree of freedom of selecting the depth, the height of the surface, and two degrees of freedom in selecting your BRDF, so in total you get 5D. Um, so with all these simplifying assumptions, we managed to do something uh, which gives you a limited sense of 3D. So let me tell you how, tell you how, how we build this display. So to build the display, we had two spatial light modulators, two planar SLMs, and we use this planar SLM to essentially display any optical surface of our choice. Uh, 
So I think that the first layer uh, is a reflective, a transmissive surface, a refractive surface or a glass, and the second layer is a, a refractive surface like a mirror. Uh, and then there is a target 3D surface that uh, we want to mimic. So if we really had uh, this uh, target uh, 3D surface in the room, so an incoming ray will uh, get to the 3D surface, reflect there, and get back to the viewer. Now in practice we had no blue surface uh, in the room. We only have uh, these two layers of the display, but we can choose, uh, choose uh, their shape. And the goal is to choose, uh, and when you have such a, uh, we have these layers, then what happens? That, uh, an incoming ray hits the first uh, transmissive layer, it uh, refracts there, change direction, and then it gets to the second layer, it reflects, gets back to the first layer, uh, refract again, and it's coming out. And if we want to say that we really mimicked the, the shape of, uh, of the target surface, we want that uh, this uh, ray, when it's uh, getting out of the first layer, it will uh, emerge at the same spatial position and the same orientation as it would have emerged if it would uh, really hit uh, the blue surface. So the goal when we design the display is to find a shape for the display layers, for the, for the two layers, so that we mimic the exact same right, uh, ray transfer as the virtual, the target virtual surface. Uh, so that's our problem. And in general, uh, it does not have a solution. But let me start with a simple case in which there is an exact closed form solution. Uh, so let's talk about what we call uh, bare leaf surfaces. So these are like thin surfaces, uh, almost planar, but still they can have a large variation in gradient orientations. And therefore, they can have a really large uh, variation in appearance. Uh, so for such surfaces, we have a closed form solution. And it's actually very simple. It says, uh, so for, uh, it says that you set the first layer as a, as a lens. And the power is a function of the depth of the target surface. And the second layer uh, is a quadratic reflector, quadratic mirror, plus a scaled version of the texture uh, on your target surface. So let's see. So let's look at this uh, bunny. And suppose that we, uh, the target depth of this planar surface uh, is behind uh, the second layer of the display. Uh, so what happened is the first layer has end up being a positive lens, and the second layer ends up being a, a negative mirror plus the scaled version of the bunny. And since the, uh, the first layer focuses the, focus the light, uh, we get a, smaller, uh, a copy of a smaller version of the bunny on the second layer. Now, in the opposite case, if we put the target bunny before the second layer of the display, then we actually get a negative uh, lens in the first layer uh, and a positive uh, mirror in the second layer. And now we get a, a, a larger, uh, an expanded version of the bunny because uh, the negative lens actually bends uh, the light, the rays in that direction. So for this case, there is really an exact flow, closed form solution. But uh, our goal is to target uh, more general 3D surfaces, not just planar uh, bare leaf surfaces. So in this case, I should say that in general, there is no close, there is no real, uh, no accurate solution, but we can still find an approximation. And we defined here some optimization problem and following the intuition from the bare leaf case, our goal is to find the first layer that uh, will focus on the second layers a ray that otherwise would have focused uh, on, uh, on the target virtual surface. So there is some optimization problems that we solve. And once we solve it, uh, we again uh, copy to the second layer the details of, uh, of the target surface according to the mapping which is defined by the first layer. So here is some, uh, uh, some uh, result of, of the optimization. So we have a target uh, surface which is just this uh, circular bump. And the front part of it uh, is in front of the second layer of the display, and uh, the back part of it is behind the second layer of the display. And you can see the solution for the first and second layer. Uh, so in the central part, uh, we get a positive lens because uh, the, the surface is in front of the, first, of the second layer. And uh, in the, back, in the periphery, we get actually a negative lens because the target is behind the, first layer of the, the second layer of the display. Uh, so let me show you some of, uh, of what you can get with uh, this uh, display. So I should say that uh, we ended up implementing this with two uh, with, uh, SLMs, and as I told you, SLMs are very small and they are very limited in resolution and in size, 
And I wanted to distinguish between uh, limitations which are inherent uh, in the model because with, uh, with a two layers uh, display we cannot really generate any arbitrary 8D, 8D light field. So I wanted to distinguish between uh, between, uh, between limitations which are inherent in the model and limitations which are uh, just due to the limitations of existing hardware. So I'll start by showing you synthetic results. Uh, so in a say synthetic result, uh, we had a target teapot and uh, we solved the optimization problem and we had an assignment for, for the two layers of the display. And then we did ray tracing on the two layers of the display and ray tracing on the real target. And I show you what uh, we get from each case. So here uh, we fix the viewpoint and we just vary the illumination. And in this case, it looks really good. And uh, what we get from the display really resemb resembles the target. So now I can also change the viewpoint. And just uh, to be more creative, I show you a different target. But uh, we can change both the viewpoint and the illumination simultaneously on the same target. We don't need to, to, show, to change the assignment on the display. Uh, so here, uh, when I, show, I change the, uh, the viewpoint, you can see, still see some depth parallax in the result of our display, but uh, it's not as good as what you get from the real target. Uh, to, to show it in a different way, I took uh, the leftmost and rightmost images of the dis of, uh, from the display, and I fused them with the green and, uh, and red channels of the same, um, of the same image. And then uh, you can see, especially around the noise, you can see the parallax that you get. So you can see that the parallax that we managed to get with our display is not as good as... It's, we get some parallax, but it's not really what you had in the target. But still, you get some sense of 3D, so maybe something... Okay, so now uh, to the real results. So as I said, we used two SLMs, and these are very limited, both in size and in resolution. And it really limited both the range from which you can view the display and the amount of depth parallax that we could show on it. And it's really, really, really a piece of, a piece of a proof of concept. And it's not something that you'll anyway use realistic in the near future. But uh, still, let me show you something. So uh, this is a target. There is some Barapapa shape, uh, which is uh, slightly has some some bump, some 3D. And we had two types of BRDFs on it, the red, uh, the green, and the blue, with two anisotropic reflectance. And here is what uh, you show when uh, uh, you vary the illumination direction. Uh, so you can see the effect of the BRDF. So when you vary the illumination horizontally, uh, the green BRDF is bright and uh, the blue BRDF is dark. And when you vary uh, vertically, you get the opposite effect. Uh, and you can also, uh, uh, by the way, uh, you have here the shadow. You can also see how the shadow change when you change the illumination. So this is a touch shadow. It's not cut shadow. Remember that there are no occlusions within this display. You can also vary the viewpoint. So you see that the bright point uh, change. So that's good. Uh, OK, so just to summarize. So this is an attempt to uh, build a display which show you a 3D content and allow you to change both the viewpoint and the illumination direction. Uh, we used it, uh, we built it with two thin uh, spatial light modulators uh, with uh, uh, bare leaf surfaces. We have a closed form solution. Uh, in the more general case, it's an optimization problem. Uh, so just to pop back a level, uh, I showed here two types of displays. The, the first one is a 4D display which show, show you especially varying BRDF uh, on a planar surface. And in the second case, we try to, uh, to show 3D content and vary both viewpoint uh, and illumination from the same, while displaying the same pattern on the display. So with some assumptions, this is a 5D subspace of the general uh, 8D problem. And we should check, keep in mind that the general problem is 8D and I don't have a good idea how to really solve the more general 8D problem, but Maybe someone in this room have a better idea, uh, and you'll write the next paper on the subject. Uh, so thank you, and uh, sorry that I'm running out of time, uh, but thank you for listening. We have time for maybe a couple of questions. I just have a very quick question. Uh, so you use these things to emulate uh, macro geometry. Uh, can you also emulate micro geometry? Like if, if suppose somebody were to shine a coherent source, would you see speckle effects too? 
Yes, you definitely see speckles in the... Uh, the, uh, the reason that, that we don't see... I mean, there are some resolution limits that you have to derive, and uh, you, don't, uh, you don't see the speckles only when you look at a certain resolution, and if, if you zoom in, you definitely see uh, speckle effects, and there, there's a relation between... Uh, the angular range of your, the angular resolution of your illumination and the amount of special resolution that you see and in which resolution you do speak. I mean, it's the whole uh, derivation that you have to do of when you see speckles and when not. And this is part of the calculations that you have to do when deriving this thing. So the second question was, do you get a bit more flexibility if uh, you use more than two uh, layers of lenses? Yes, you can. Uh, we started to derive it, and yes, uh, you have more powers. Uh, the, more, uh, the more layers you have, uh, the more power you have, but uh, also the optimization problems becomes more complicated. And we started to play with it, and uh, we didn't get uh, to finish it. Okay, so in the paper there is an exact derivation, but uh, I'll say uh, uh, first there is a relation between the angular the trade-off between the angular resolution and the spatial resolution. Uh, the, the amount of BRDFs you can do, uh, you can, uh, currently we did only BRDFs which are a function of the f-vector. So they have two, only two degrees of freedom, they are not general BRDF. Uh, you can do arbitrary, BRD, arbitrary 2D BRDFs up to resolution limit, limits which are uh, a function of the pitch and the size of the pixel and uh, the angular range of your illumination and various relations like that that you de we derive, but uh, I don't have a rule of thumb to give you. <laughs> All right, thank you. Let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, our next talk is by Jana Kainer-Storfer from CMU. She's going to talk about deep tissue imaging. All right. Thank you. Um, thanks for the invitation, Ashwin. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. It's not a, a typical conference for me, and I've learned a lot already. Um, so I am an assistant professor in biomedical engineering here at Carnegie Mellon, and what we do is optical imaging of biomedical tissue, which really means what we're trying to do is build optical instruments to, to monitor disease or, or diagnose a disease. And so, um, really, I would like to start out with the motivation of my lab, which is really focused on trying to quantify microvascular changes in whatever body part, um, and the two that, that I'm going to be focusing on today are breast cancer and uh, traumatic brain injury. Um, and really the idea of my lab is to build instrumentation that can monitor and quantify the microvasculature inside tissues, so very deep down, um, and a mixture of data processing and then clinical translation. So really the goal is to use non-invasive methods to, to monitor disease. And so I've heard uh, uh, quite a few talks talking about uh, scattering and, and, and imaging through fog and and that's pretty much exactly what we are trying to do, but for, for the human body. And so um, while we have to deal with scattering, uh, really what we're mostly interested in is, is then an absorption contrast uh, in tissue. And so the two, the two inherent um, ways that light interacts with uh, biological tissues is absorption and scattering, completely neglecting fluorescence here. But, um, and, and absorption is, is really the contrast uh, that gives us information about tissue constituents, and that's what we're interested in. And so I'm going to be silly for a second and, and essentially describe this in terms of uh, uh, cranberry juice and milk. And so cranberry juice is red because it absorbs all, based on absorbance, all, all of the colors of light except for red, so it goes through, and so we see cranberry juice to be red. Uh, milk, which is pretty much 100% water, or 98% water, um, is not um, translucent because of scattering, and so scattering particles. Um, and so the reason I'm, I'm bringing this up, because optically speaking, our body is pretty much a mixture of cranberry, and, cranberry juice and milk. Um, so what I mean with this is red light goes through the human body, a uh, very uh, large scale, um, and it gets scattered like crazy, so very much like cranberry juice and milk. 
And so, um, so that, that image here pretty much nicely il illustrates this. If I use a, a red laser pointer, except for if you have red na nail polish, it doesn't work that well, but um, if you use a, a red laser pointer, it goes through the finger, green and blue does not tran um, transmit through the finger that well. And it all boils down to this absorption coefficient. Uh, and our body dominantly absorbs light uh, based on, on hemoglobin. And so hemoglobin is very highly absorbing in all of the visible colors, um, but it is really not absorbing in the red and near-infrared range. Um, and uh, the neat thing is that, that, and that's from a physiological point of view very interesting, is that oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin have different absorption spectra. That's pretty much why veins kind of look blue and arteries look red, because of the oxygen content of hemoglobin. And so, in principle, uh, uh, if you have, uh, if you build something that is multispectral, multi multicolor in the near infrared range, we can, adect, um, we can quantify the oxygen content of hemoglobin um, in, in various scenarios. And because uh, the absorption coefficient is so low in the red and the near infrared range, we can do deep tissue imaging. So what do I mean by that? I kind of demonstrated that with the finger already, but uh, think of it from your uh, childhood. If you take a flashlight and you put it in your mouth, which color do you see? Anyone? Red, exactly. And so that's what you're seeing. Um, and, and then I want to demonstrate, I mean, this is a silly picture, but um, what you can maybe appreciate is the, the, the length scale of how, um, how wide red light travels inside, body, inside the body. And so everything I've said has been used before uh, for pulse oximetry that's decades old, so essentially shining light through the finger at two different colors, um, and one can differentiate or can quantify the oxygen content of hemoglobin, at least in the arteries. Um, but uh, pretty much what everything I'm talking about is kind of a very fancy version, version of pulse oximetry, but for deep tissue imaging. Um, and so the way uh, in my field we, we quantify or we describe light propagation in tissue is based on a diffusion equation, uh, which essentially says that, uh, so it's, a, it's an approximation of the radiative transport equation. And it's an equation that essentially describes how, um, how intense the affluence rate um, is spatially and temporally varying inside tissue based on scattering as well as absorption. And so the top right is essentially demonstrating that if you shine light into, into a highly scattering medium, it scatters everywhere given the um, propagation based on a diffusion equation. And so in principle, if I, if I put a, a light source onto a highly scattering media, uh, I can quantify essentially that the highest probability of a photon traveling somewhere and then coming back out again to be detected in reflectance mode. Um, and so due to this highly scattering nature. Um, so, the two applications that I want to talk about is, as I mentioned, breast cancer monitoring and, and traumatic brain injury. So, uh, for breast cancer, the, the motivation is that um, X-ray mammography, so that's the top right, is very good in, in trying to, to quantify or trying to diagnose breast cancer. Um, but it's really not a, a very good tool to, uh, to monitor chemotherapy uh, progression, neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Um, and that's due to, to the radiation um, of X-ray. Um, so what is known is that uh, with, with tip, most breast cancer cases are, are highly vascularized tumors due to angiogenesis. And so we know that, it um, uh, has been shown before that, that hemoglobin and blood content in, in the region of the, the lesion and in the, in the region of, of breast cancer can be very uh, indicative of, of treatment outcome. And so, um, again, a, kind of a silly picture, the internet is full of them. Um, if you essentially just take a flashlight and put it underneath a, a breast and there is a, a cancerous lesion, there will be more blood in that particular region and that shows up in an image uh, as, a, as, a, as an optical contrast. Going a little bit further and trying to quantify this, uh, and I'll talk about how this is done in a second, but trying to quantify the amount of hemoglobin in, in that lesion can then be used to, to really track uh, um, progression of, of a disease or, or trying to see how effective uh, chemotherapy is. 
And so there are different methods out there that are trying to achieve exactly that. And so that is an instrument that has been developed by Columbia, where the idea is to put uh, optical fibers placed all around the breast, and then uh, so the breasts are, are placed in, in those cup holders. Um, uh, for then trying to, to um, quantify light uh, transport through tissue at multiple wavelengths. Uh, another example would be more mammography style uh, uh, transmission through the breast uh, with, with optical fibers and trying to, to look at uh, light transfer through the tissue that way. Uh, and a somewhat handheld ex uh, device is, is placing in reflectance mode on the breast and trying to scan, scan tissue uh, along the breast. And all of those have in common that they can map out the hemoglobin content of breast cancer lesions, um, which is really uh, the, the big pros. They're non-invasive instrumentations and information about the vasculature uh, can be gained. But the cons that we have identified is really that it's a very large footprint, extremely expensive, because uh, tissue is still very hi uh, highly absorbing and scattering, so we, we're losing a lot of photons. Um, and, and it's really a large footprint. And so what we have been thinking is, well, can we turn this around and can we build an instrument that can give us the same kind of information, um, but for a patient to be able to take that instrument home and do monitoring uh, herself um, in a small portable device. And uh, so the way we envision this, uh, um, well, the short story is instead of manual palpation, which is essentially a finger and feeling the breast cancer lesion, we uh, replace the finger with, uh, with optics, uh, with a camera and a lens. And in particular, what we're using is uh, spatial frequency domain imaging. Um, so, uh, the SFDI, um, which is really spatial pattern um, uh, illumination. Um, and instead of, look, instead of using uh, the spatial patterns to do any kind of 3D reconstruction of tissue, what we're doing is really place a, a polarizer in front of the light source, so it shine, shine polarized light onto tissue um, and get rid uh, and have a second polarizer um, 90 degrees to it in order to then remove any specular reflection. So we really are only interested in the photons that have traveled deep inside tissue and we're completely removing specular reflection. Um, and so we, we shine multiple uh, frequencies, spatial frequencies onto tissue, multiple phases from which uh, we can um, extract what's called the diffuse reflectance component from which we can calculate the absorption and scattering coefficient. Uh, and in this case, it's, a, it's an example of, a, of, a, of an arm where you can see in an absorption coefficient map uh, the veins uh, showing higher absorption, so more hemoglobin in that region. And everything boils down to, again, a diffusion equation, but solved for in the spatial frequency domain. Um, and so essentially the, the, the diffuse reflectance is a function of spatial frequency um, as well as the, then the uh, absorption and scattering coefficient and by taking um, a reference image and then an image on the breast we can quantify diffuse reflectance and from which we can extract the absorption and scattering coefficient which then can be used to quantify hemoglobin content. Um, so the way we built this is, uh, so we have a, we modified a TI Lightcrafter uh, module um, to retrofit some, some NIR uh, wavelengths into it. Um, and so that's very small and compact. We're illuminating tissue with two frequencies uh, in the spatial frequency domain and, um, and three phases each. Um, and what is known is that uh, this, the, the penetration depth or the, the, the sensitivity um, of that instrument is, is a function of spatial frequency. And so the lower the spatial frequency, the deeper we can essentially see inside the tissue. But we're limited to, um, to a few millimeters uh, still inside tissue. And so breast cancer uh, can be located multiple centimeters inside the tissue, so we wouldn't be sensitive to that. And the way we get around this is by taking advantage of the mechanical properties of, of, of tissue, which essentially say that breast cancer, breast tumors are, tend to be uh, much stiffer than the surrounding tissue. Um, so in the order of three, uh, three kilopascal compared to 10 kilopascal. Um, and, and really the way 
we do this is by compression, but it's not compression like mammography, but localized compression. So again, think of it as a finger um, compressing the tissue. And so what that does is effectively brings the stiff lesion closer to the surface to then be imaged by, by our method. Um, and so um, in order to test this, we developed phantoms um, that have the right mechanical as well as, as optical properties since we're using silicone with titanium dioxide to mimic scattering as well as, um, as, well as ink to mimic absorption. And so essentially the, the background material is somewhere close to like gummy bear-ish uh, stiffness uh, versus a rubber pencil um, um, eraser on a, on a, on a pencil. Um, uh, which roughly corresponds to essentially the, the, the mechanical contrast you would get from breast cancer lesions. Um, and so we're embedding highly absorbing uh, uh, breast cancer mimicking lesions at varying depths um, in, inside those phantoms and we use the, the spatial frequency domain approach with compression uh, to see how, how well we can quantify the optical contrast of those lesions. Um, and so the way this works is that if we, so the, the right hand side is a 2D map of uh, the optical properties, in this case the absorption coefficient of the phantom extracted from SFDI, from, from the spatial frequency domain imaging. And so what you can see is that essentially there's, there's no contrast uh, and as soon as we start compressing locally, uh, the contrast of the lesion or mimicking uh, lesion uh, increases and you can very clearly see um, even with, with this very cheap, otherwise superficial imaging method, we can, we can look at lesions that are up to two centimeters down. Um, and so really in conclusion for this project, uh, before I switch to brain imaging, is um, that we can, we can use a, a handheld device um, uh, that is quite cheap to build in comparison to other instruments out there um, and, and look inside uh, tissue to quantify breast cancer lesions. And so the way that we envision this is essentially uh, monitoring at home where the rib cage is, is providing the a stiff uh, background and then compression, local compression of the lesion. Um, and real briefly, uh, one other thing that I want to talk about is, uh, is how we can use near-infrared imaging, or imaging very loosely used here, um, uh, spectroscopy to monitor cerebral hemodynamic changes. And so, in principle, uh, if you put optical fibers on somebody's head, uh, because near-infrared light goes so far inside tissue, um, light can travel all the way through the skin, bone, interact with the brain, come back out again to be measured, and we're sensitive to hemodynamic changes in the brain. And so that's kind of the idea here. The red blob is typically uh, kind of the region we're interested in. Um, and what we can do is uh, look at changes in the absorption coefficient as a function of time um, um, in, in the brain. And one, what one can do is uh, come up with uh, or can measure um, temporal changes of oxygen deoxyhemoglobin as the brain is doing something. So it is essentially functional activation. And so in this case, we put a sensor in the region of what is the motor cortex, and we're very much sensitive to changes. And uh, when the brain is active, there's an increase in cerebral blood flow, um, and that, that corresponds to an increase in oxyhemoglobin. And I'm kind of rushing through this, but um, the idea is that at least at a, at a single point with one optical fiber pair, uh, we can nicely look at functional activation in terms of hemoglobin changes inside the brain. And so in principle, this can be extended uh, as, as essentially an imaging method and 3D reconstruction tomography, which is uh, what a group at, at WashU, uh, Joe Culver's group, is doing. And they have really nicely demonstrated that optically we can get as high resolution as, as functional magnetic resonance imaging. Um, but what my lab is interested in is trying to not so much map out hemoglobin changes, but look at a single pixel um, uh, 
change in the brain and with a specific idea in mind, which is can we look at intracranial pressure and how intracranial pressure, so the pressure inside the head, um, influences the hemodynamic changes. And the reason we're interested in this is because the current state of the art is to measure intracranial pressure in traumatic brain injury is by drilling a hole and sticking a pressure probe inside the brain. So that's not really applicable for a whole lot of patients. Um, and so, so the question is, can we do something differently? And so we are going to, uh, we're, we're using an animal model, um, again, single location, single pixel sensor on the head. We change into cranial pressure in a particular fashion, so by, by putting fluid inside the, the animal's brain. Um, and we measure uh, the hemodynamic changes um, uh, and we measure hemodynamic changes as, a, as it reacts to the intracranial pressure. And so the approach we're taking is essentially a transfer function approach where we say, okay, we have our intracranial pressure as an input, measure the hemodynamics, and then try to estimate intracranial pressure from it. Um, and it's a little bit of a cheating example, but a good example is, is uh, uh, so as a function of time in this one single pixel, we look at uh, oxy and deoxyhemoglobin as it varies with intracranial pressure. Uh, and then the transfer function approach is essentially uh, purple is the invasively pressure probe, uh, invasive pressure probe in, in the brain. And the black is our non-invasive version, um, which um, maybe you can appreciate magnitude and phase are really well matched. So we're hopeful that we can approach a non-invasive uh, intracranial pressure uh, monitoring. So in conclusion, what I've told you is that we use multiple scattered light um, for deep tissue imaging and use an absorption contrast to really tell us something about uh, tissue constituents. And so we're using that to build handheld devices for breast cancer monitoring, as well as bedside compatible uh, systems that can monitor hemoglobin changes um, and help us uh, uh, guide treatment in, in, in multiple patient populations. And so with that, I would like to acknowledge my funding sources, my amazing lab, um, and, um, and I would be happy to take any questions. Um, actually, it's somewhat comparable. So we have to stick to ANSI standards, which is uh, typically 0.2 watts per centimeter squared. That's on the surface. Um, so, uh, which is comparable to bright daylight, I think. Um, but how much makes it down? Well, the intensity is exponentially decreasing per, so it's like an order of magnitude per centimeter, I would say. It's like it's pretty much nothing in the center of the brain. Yeah, it depends. Oh. Are you asking about possibly stimulating? <laughs> Yeah, no, I think you'd be losing more, but I would love to chat more offline. One in the back. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, for the tumor imaging, the breast tumor imaging, yeah. it looked like you had the projector and the camera on the same side. Yes. Um, and I was wondering, um, in terms of contrast, uh, because if I understand correctly what's happening, the, the tumor would be sort of like a shadow uh, uh, region, right? So, uh, in a way, yes. I see. Um, so I, I know there, there's a group that is actually trying this. Um, I, I think that, so, um, if you were to go with transmission without necessarily compression, you can think of eight to 10 centimeters of, of tissue. And I think you would lose all the features of the, of the modulation of the spatial frequencies. And the spatial frequencies are really needed to then quantify the optical properties. So I know there's a group that is actually trying this and essentially trying to do compression. So you have thinner slabs of tissue, 
um, and, and then trying to do the spatial patterns through, through transmission, which in theory, yes, would be a much better contrast. Um, but we haven't tried that. Um, yeah, spatial resolution always comes up as a as a as a topic. It's like, in principle, with with the the breast cancer SFDI approach, uh, we could go much higher resolution. I actually don't even know what we're using now. We downsample typically to like a couple of millimeters, um, and that is simply because we are talking about such diffuse, <coughs> multi-scattered light. So there's not really any. Point, I think to improve the spatial resolution that much because you will you're limited by scattering, and so scattering is typically in the order of uh, well, well, you guys, that's a very vague answer. The current uh, resolution is down simple to like a couple of millimeters, and I don't think there is an improvement if we were wanted to go higher, just because imaging wise we could do it, but you're limited by scattering of tissue. For the breast tumor imaging example, uh, how many spatial patterns do you project typically? Um, our latest one is uh, one spatial pattern, one DC, um, and so two and then three phases, and then three different wavelengths. So. Three different frequencies? No, uh, two different frequencies, uh, three, three phases, so we're shifting the... So approximately the what's the capture time? Uh, 0.3, Point uh, 300 milliseconds. Okay. For all of them, yeah. Okay. In the very back. So, In principle, again, the, the, the way I would uh, see this is it's, it's, you can image something very sharply that is inherently blurry. So the thing is that you are using multiple, what we're doing is multiple scattered light um, where the, the limitation is really given by diffusion of photons. So um, we haven't played too much in terms of, of just spatial contrast. I'm not saying there's not something there to, to possibly um, explore. We just haven't done it because I don't necessarily see the point in um, from a clinical perspective. But I'd be happy to hear ideas. One last question in the back. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, uh, the last talk in the session is by Ashu Sabarwal from RICE. Uh, he's going to talk about the cell phone sensing of uh, biobehaviors. Thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to thank Ashwin for the invite. Uh, and before I start, I thought I'll put everybody in the mindset to, for the next 20 minutes. Um, so I was thinking about last night, how would I introduce what I'm, the level at which I'm going to talk about today. It will be, if I were writing a novel, all I know is the name of the main character. I don't know the rest of the story. So that's what the rest of the talk will look like. <clears throat> um, so the, the main character of the story is uh, in what is in healthcare considered to be the elephant in the room, and which is human behavior. So you, uh, I've been working for seven, eight years with uh, quite a few healthcare professionals, quite um, several of them on the behavior side of things. And there is a general consensus that we have very little understanding of patient behavior, which has a huge impact on health outcomes. And here is a chart from a book 21, 20, more than 25 years ago. Uh, at that time, even there was a reasonable consensus in the healthcare community that how much impact human behavior has on our health outcomes. And in this pie chart, it is actually the biggest part of the pie. Okay. Um, so in many cases, uh, we actually know how behavior impacts biology and hence health. So we have all have now strong evidence for these behaviors. Smoking behaviors can cause problems with lungs, which leads to serious illnesses. 
and so does poor diet and exercise. Um, in the long term, in the more medium term, uh, inhaler or, or medication error use causes problems to, again, biology, which causes more serious healthcare outcomes. And then even shorter outcome uh, time scale, you can, uh, for example, surgery recovery times are actually heavily dependent on whether the patients follow through their regimen after the surgery. Now, the key thing to note among, for all these behaviors is that they all occur outside the hospital. So, we, they don't occur in the building. In fact, if you look at our total time we spend in our life, we spend, for most of us, very little time inside a clinical or a healthcare facility. Um, and then the only instrument we really have at our disposal today to understand behavior is questionnaire. We ask questions. Um, and the worst still is that we actually don't understand the impact of any behavior truly on biology. We have very population level understanding but never, not a personal or pri uh, personalized understanding of how a specific behaviors impact somebody's biology and health. Um, now, last, over the last 20 or so years, there has been actually increasingly um, uh, strong evidence which has built up through the area of epigenetics and in the sub-area of behavioral epigenetics which has shown that ex uh, different behaviors do actually have impact at a, at, at a DNA level, at the gene actuation level of how our biology reacts to things. And in fact, this pathway is bi-directional, so behavior impacts biology and vice versa, biology actually impacts our behaviors too. Okay. Now, the, the thing is that we are actually really, really good at measuring biomarkers. Um, and in terms of measuring behaviors, I would say we are at least 100 years, perhaps more behind being able to measure behaviors. Um, now, and measurements are really crucial for any change. So, uh, a, a typical uh, control process or change process for anything, including behavior change, is that you have to be able to measure something first. You have to create models for it before you can create, modify those things. And that's, this cycle applies to many things we do, uh, not just for behavior change. Um, so currently, the way behavior change or uh, our behavioral patterns change happen, we rely heavily on memory, which we know has, is supposed to be inaccurate and biased, which leads to poor models of actual reality for us and then generally our strategies don't work. Any behavioral intervention strategies typically don't work when applied to a single individual, uh, largely. Um, and in fact, one of the most uh, useful uh, behavior change strategy or, uh, for example, for weight control is to actually take your weight every day. It's actually fundamentally built on measurement, a periodic measurement every day. Now, uh, this kind of sounds like a simple example, but for many chronic conditions, this is crucial. So we all know for in diabetes, glucose measurements are crucial for their uh, good healthcare outcomes. And in these conditions, uh, biobehavioral connection is largely missing today. In fact, today we only measure a biomarker and all behavioral components are actually not touched. We are, and in fact, uh, many folks who, uh, who suffer from diabetes would tell you that there is an impact or some interrelationship between behavior on their healthcare status. So there is a large sub-community among diabetics which are actually working themselves on creating, understanding these connections and adapting their own regimen. Um, so what's our, hope, hopefully that gives an understanding of where we're coming from and that's basically what our mission in Scalable Health Labs at RICE is to build what we, I call biobehavioral sensors. Okay, so they are very broadly defined and the objective is that we want to build biobehavioral sensing layer in healthcare, which allow, we should be measuring both biomarkers and behavior markers at the same time. Um, do it, and since we're talking about behavior, we will have to do it non-intrusively and of course, since we're talking about clinical practice, do it accurately. Now, in behavior measurement, as I said, the, the, the gold standard for measurement is an the only instrument we really have is questionnaire. So for all measurement of behavior, the thought process for us always starts by, hey, what questions do we ask today and can I just not ask that question? Can I build something which uses sensor, um, broadly defined, um, to actually make it a quantitative measurement? Okay, so actually, I'm sure pretty much everybody is, has a behavior measurement tool on, their, on them these days which is a step counter, okay? So that's actually a um, method of instead of asking, 
do you walk or do you exercise regularly, our exercise monitors are actually giving us that information uh, automatically now. Okay. Um, so what's the, the, the spectrum of projects we have working? Um, they uh, broadly divide into three buckets. Uh, on the rightmost side, we have uh, projects which we work on which are where there's a clear clinical need. Uh, products actually exist today, but the problems in our opinion remain still not su uh, sufficiently solved. Um, then in the middle, there is clear clinical need, but there is zero uh, 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 quantitative solution and mental health is actually a great example of that. The whole effort is built on asking patients questions. And then the leftmost side is where there are many clinical hypotheses, but simply no research can be done because there are no tools to actually measure, in this case, behavior to actually answer those questions. Um, so the, the type of questions we ask is, I want to give a flavor of questions, how we start. These are the flavor of questions we ask. Can we measure loneliness? Um, how do we know loneliness impact health? Do, how do we measure depressive or anxiety states, which are crucial for mental health? How do we know our, so what our social structure impacts our choices, especially when it comes to healthcare? How do we make our dietary choices as a specific example and how do those choices impact our biology? Okay. So uh, you can see these questions are fairly broad. I don't have answers to all, actually all of them. Um, and those are, but those are our driving questions for doing many of those uh, current uh, research. So I thought I'll pick two questions today uh, just to give a sense of how we're trying to you know, take very, very small steps towards answering those rather broad questions. And uh, uh, I have to say I bias these choice of questions because they have a camera somewhere in this solution today. But I will not talk anything about the actual imaging part of it there. Everybody in this room knows more about imaging than I do. Um, okay, so let's pick up, uh, let's pick up uh, the first question. Is how do we make our dietary choices? And this is really difficult. Actually, if we all asked, we're talking about behavior, we're talking about human behavior. All of us are technically experts in our own behavior. We, we think we all understand ourselves very well. So if we actually ask ourselves questions, how do we make our food choices? And you, once you start thinking about it a little bit, you will recognize it's actually non-trivial to figure it out. Okay. Um, often the answer is, I miss a free will answer that I do it because I make the choices. But turns out actually that's not really true completely. <laughs> Uh, loosely speaking, uh, the behavior choices, or sorry, dietary choices fall into two categories. And then the first big category is availability. Uh, you really cannot eat something which is not available. So, so your availability actually immediately determines what your feasible set of choices is. So what food sources you have and the availability could also be how much time do you have and then what skills you have to actually uh, prepare foods. But then the, there is another category which is influences. We are influenced in our food choices both externally and internally. We really don't understand how these influences work because we really cannot measure them in any reasonable manner. Okay, so let's focus on this large piece of puzzle on a very specific question. A, how do a specific choice of external uh, influences impact our decisions? And in this case, I'll focus on external influences which are essentially things we watch. And we spend a lot of time in front of screen these days. And these choices, uh, this question is actually highly relevant for, for children, which are actually, uh, if you look at any uh, children's network, there are tons and tons of food commercials of different types, cereals and juices and so on and so forth. They know they are the audience to target because they influence decisions of when they go to their grocery shops with their parents, they know what to the, they want to pick. Okay. So there is a reason behind advertisement um, for those choices. So we want to understand how do these influence, these uh, things they watch uh, potentially influence their decision. Now this is already a very, very big question actually. So let's start with something, uh, uh, something simpler. And so that's the goal of uh, uh, an ongoing uh, effort, um, which is to only uh, first quantify uh, who watched what and when and with whom. Okay, so we want to just get what are they watching and uh, how much are they, they watching it and what is their social context in this case. Okay? Um, 
So this, uh, the question is been uh, specifically uh, reduced to is because we can actually leverage existing technologies to start answering, to at least addressing this part of the puzzle. And this is actually fairly straightforward. We can leverage a lot of front-facing cameras. Um, and uh, even though there are tons of uh, uh, challenges in this when you want to actually understand who's watching what, and there are quite a few of uh, existing solutions. So thank you for the computer vision community uh, for making huge advances in being able to actually take uh, video feeds of people doing things and classify them into categories of whether they're watching or not, what screen they're watching, and do it fairly accurately, okay? So I won't comment on that. This, this, is, uh, um, this is an area which has already you know, uh, made huge advances in the last few years, and we are benefiting heavily from all those advances. Now, the, the harder question is uh, beyond the quantity of who's watching what, the harder question we want to an remember answer is, what is the influence of what we are watching on our decisions? And that's really difficult if you actually, you don't have to think very long to actually conclude it's not an easy question. So, um, so we start with a hypothesis that, uh, that the, our chances of being influenced by something have to depend on how engaged we are in that content. So cursory looks at certain things won't necessarily actually influence us. That's the underlying uh, uh, hypothesis. So as a, uh, to, to even to address this hypothesis, whether it's true or not, we, we're trying to build, can we understand cognitive engagement as an intermediate marker uh, to, uh, to answering these questions. Okay. Now, that by itself is actually a fairly large and uh, uh, well-discussed problem of uh, measuring cognitive engagement. And there are tons of solutions often done in psychology or uh, behavioral sciences literature of trying to understand how engaged you are or how uh, uh, you are in a specific thing you are watching or doing. Okay. Now, these are all unfortunately not good fit for us because they require putting a sensor on and that will be a difficult in our scenario when we are trying to watch to understand uh, in a free-flowing environment like a family. Um, so there is another alternative which is a gold standard in understanding cognitive load, which is pupillar metry. Um, it relies on a, a very interesting uh, fact about our body. If we actually think very hard about some problem, our pupils dilate. We really don't know why that happens. So here is a typical test in psychology where you are given easy problems then your pupils will be of specific size. When the moment you're given harder problems, your pupils will dilate. And at some point you will give up, your pupils will actually contract back. So you know exactly at what point you gave up trying to think about that problem. Now, pupillometry would be a, a, a good way for us to do it, but in our scenario, when we want to measure influence, especially in these difficult scenarios where the cameras could be far away or there could be all sorts of lighting conditions, so it's completely uncontrolled. So, pupillometry, unfortunately, is not a good solution for us. In addition, pupils dilate for other reasons beyond cognitive load, which is because of variation in illumination. So, we need a more robust method of understanding engagement, how engaged you are in a, con in a, uh, in a content. So, um, there we are actually uh, exploring the idea, can the whole head motion be used as a marker for understanding engagement? And the, the, the reason is straightforward. If we are talking about visual task here, for us to be able to engage in a visual task, we will need to focus. That means if we are moving our head too much in that task, there is a little chance we can actually pay attention to the task. Um, so to test out these hypotheses, whether this is really true or not, we decided we'll actually first leverage a large uh, data set which is already online, which is YouTube gamers putting picture-in-picture -picture videos, uh, gaming videos where you will have them uh, they're playing a video game and then they have themselves videotaped at the same time. So we have a knowledge of the task and then how their reaction to the task. Okay. Um, so this has, we have assembled from 27 different gamers, a fairly large data set which is now well labeled. Um, and again, uh, what we are finding is that all these head motion metrics uh, actually are a reasonable indicator of how engaged you are. So here are some of the features which actually we can which are, make sense, physically make sense, like how often do you blink, uh, what is your eye gaze velocity uh, or motion changes or head motion changes, all of them have some explanatory power to how engaged you are in the task, okay? 
Um, and of course, if you throw in uh, the black box, which the first speaker mentioned, things improve a lot better. It actually extracts more interesting features um, uh, to improve the accuracy. Okay. So you can. So I won't actually have a result which everybody will, uh, uh, you know, stand up and clap. There is no result like that today on this. This is, we are in extremely uh, early stages of it, so I wanted to give a sense of the types of questions we are asking and how we are trying to actually make uh, progress on them. And part of my reason for, uh, instead of presenting results, uh, I, and I'm presenting questions today, is that there is a whole lot of smart people and I would like, I'm hoping that some of you will work on these really difficult problems of measuring behavior. Okay. Um, so on the second question, I thought I'll talk a little bit more uh, uh, just to give a sense of now more from, instead of from the behavior measurement side, how does the biological measurement side actually plays into our whole uh, puzzle. And here, uh, we'll look at a specific question which is actually slightly easier question than the first one. Not that it is an easy question, it's just a slightly easier question, which is that how do our dietary choices impact our biology? And we would like that to understand both in the short and long term. And this question is really crucial for folks with diabetes because for their life actually revolves a lot about understanding their diet and doing uh, control around it, uh, their medication control around it, okay. So just as a quick, quick lesson, uh, how when we eat something which is on the rightmost side, uh, it increases, uh, it, uh, our pancreas produces insulin and then <coughs> the, the, the cells are take, uh, take up the glucose then the, when we need to actually burn uh, energy, we need to actually, that uh, stored glucose is, or glucogen is actually broken and then used for uh, creating energy in our body. So there is a tight loop, control loop which is happening, um, which allows us to actually uh, manage our diet and how our body uh, uses that uh, glucose. So. Um, the, when in, type, in diabetes, there are two forms of it, uh, type 1 where the beta cells become silent and type 2 where the control, this whole control system degrades. So a, a, the tip, a, one of the therapy solutions is to inject insulin so that we can have a, a glu we can take care of this glucose insulin balance. But in this case, instead of our body doing this automatic control, the, the person, the patient has to do this control themselves. So a key part of their control process is to be able to estimate how much carbs they have in a food, which is really difficult for complex food, which is what we commonly eat. Um, so often they will actually use even, this is the state of the art today, manual diaries. So a large uh, center level grant, our goal is to actually change that practice. So the center is going to try to build a variable for, for diabetic populations. Uh, it's an imaging problem where something is embedded below the skin surface, which actually allows us to hopefully build a lab on the wrist. Now, this is biomarker data. How can we actually, we are trying to use the biomarker data to actually measure a behavior. In this case, what we're trying to do is take a glucose time series and use the fact that our body breaks down different nutrition components at a different rate, for example, carbs, protein, and fats. And can we take this input time series and turn it into a, a essentially a variable for diet or for nutrition? Okay, um, so that's how we are hoping that we can actually address this puzzle that we don't have to guess too much of what a food does to us. Eventually we can start to make an understanding of as we eat, how it impacts our body and then use that as a way to guide our future uh, uh, decisions. Now on the long term, um, as you can see there is a, a glucose profile here which goes um, above and below the band. The band is where our body would like to keep it to, which is considered the normal glucose ranges. Uh, however, when you have diabetes, it goes above and below, and these are called glycemic variabilities, and they are really damaging for our body, for, for a diabetic uh, body. Um, so you will, ideally, we'd like to avoid those uh, variabilities. However, they are uh, on the very difficult to uh, do this for long term. Imagine try having to manage your diet and measure glucose uh, constantly throughout your life. So as a result, a poor glycemic control actually has severe long-term impact. Um, uh, they often happen in the periphery, eyes and feet. Uh, for example, uh, the, <coughs> the, uh, the arteries get calcified. Uh, as a result, the uh, perfusion to the foot reduces, so amputation becomes actually an endpoint for many of the diabetes. So it's a pretty severe outcome. 
Um, but currently there is no way of measuring blood perfusion. Actually the previous speaker was talking about it and um, the, of measuring perfusion more in the, for the cancer. But the same idea actually is needed here. Um, and so there we are building in fact the same camera based solution which in, in this case measures pulsatile perfusion um, of how the perfusion changes happen as a, uh, in synchrony with the heartbeat. Um, and there we have actually made pretty decent progress in being able to actually see uh, perfusion changes in, in real time. And so this is a simple experiment using that, that system where the, there's a person's hand is, has normal perfusion and in soon it will go dark because we have actually used a blood pressure curve to cut off the circulation to there. And as it comes back, you can see the perfusion comes live and there's in fact uh, an exc excursion which we can actually capture pretty well. Okay. Now this is actually part of a much larger effort with actually several colleagues in the uh, um, and expeditions in computing we started today of uh, trying to go a much higher resolution than what we can do today and they, again uh, as everybody in this audience can appreciate scattering is a big barrier. So we are hoping that we can actually get to uh, you know do actually much better uh, imaging than what I showed um, um, at maybe at the end of the five years. Okay. So with that actually I will stop. Uh, the work I described is fairly collaborative. I work quite closely with behavior scientists and we are across the world's biggest medical center which makes our job a little bit easier. Um, and then um, all thanks goes to the students and postdocs who actually take on these difficult uh, challenges and the problems which I talked about. With that I'll thank you and take any questions or comments. Time for a couple of questions, one in the back. Yeah, there is, unfortunately, I would love to have that too, but yeah, that's not, um, there is the equivalent of DNA, there would be nice if there was a behavior genome. Right? We will say, this is how you can describe everybody's behavior. These are the variables to measure. And I, I think we can probably make an exhaustive list, but we have no idea what that, I think beyond making a list, there is much of a uh, structure, like a light equation, which we can actually then use for doing something. And so the, the thought process is perhaps, uh, uh, the, for us is building this or understanding this through examples rather than the theory first or, like, or rather large structure first. So that's why you see all these projects are specific instances where measuring a specific behavior uh, is really important for a particular condition. Now we are hoping that as we get better at it, these tools as we develop for specific condition become our instruments on the left side of the project which is to conduct scientific inquiry where we can postulate hypotheses and start to measure them. But I think we are very long way, way from, there, from there, yeah. But I don't know whether it will happen in my lifetime, but <laughs> I hope I get to see it. Yeah, for sure it's possible, yeah. So there is a, uh, uh, so I, I want to say these are all hypotheses that we, if we do this, then maybe we can do that. Uh, so that really falls in that left category of questions. But the other thing, a very key thing, advertisement is not a single shot. Actually, we don't easily get influenced with high likelihood on one look at it. So that's why advertisements play over and over again. So they, there is actually an understanding that you have to build it as a normative thought in the, that means it's normal to drink, uh, let's say Coca-Cola. And that's why Coca-Cola spends, would spend more money than Pepsi and be in more places for you to actually make it a normative thought. Once it becomes a normative thought, when you have to make a decision, we know that we make decisions at two different time scales. The first decision which are called uh, essentially immediate decisions, they are actually a little bit random. They are based on what's the, the most normative thought we have. 
<coughs> okay, so the things made in a very quick. Um, and that's why advertisers work very hard to make it a normative thought so that when you go there, what's the thing you will pick? That's the one the thing you've seen most often and feel it's the normal thing to do. The other th set of thought which are very, uh, you know, when you think about it, you take the problem home and sleep on it essentially, and those are much more logically uh, or sound decisions and you may actually not pick any drink in that case. But we don't make many of our choices during day with, the, with that way. Question? Right. <laughs> um, are there some methods that could be taken from that world? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, uh, so there is a, the, some. Of, there are many projects which I did not list because they didn't have a camera. <laughs> um, but there is a very cool, uh, which is a. a hap we are actually doing it simultaneously, mostly because we have just got a postdoc who is actually coming from that world, and there they are un using understanding uh, language patterns. There is a language in animal world is least considered simpler because they're generally sounds and they, the library is uh, smaller and it doesn't, it doesn't look like for many animals they actually form more complex things. But they can see how, for example, in chimpanzees, when they find food, they have two types of behaviors and they actually discovered that through what type of utterances they produce. And so the two behaviors are they would actually be very quiet <coughs> in some cases and be actually uh, noisy in other cases. And they discovered, when they actually studied it, it was the first a phenomena they, they observed. But then the explanation they found was that um, when they're quiet, they're generally quiet when the food is scarce. They don't want to share. But they, if the food is abundant, they will actually share and they will call others to their food. Um, so we are actually applying the same, uh, same idea but not around food and stuff, but idea of actually using speech patterns and stuff for addressing one of the questions which I listed, can you measure loneliness? So we're building what we call egocentric physical social network and by essentially people just wear a band and we want to understand at what context you talk and how much do you get out of each conversation and the, 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 the psychology or the behavioral science theory behind it is that in conversations, the conversations where we feel we got most out of it are the ones where we actually take turns. I talk, you talk, you talk, I talk so on and so forth. Where there is a active turn taking is where we actually feel engaged in that conversation versus where we are only listeners. So we can actually measure that behavior. But then but hopefully that will be a, a, a small tool in the, we, if we have that tool then we can start to conduct more experiments. But yes, I think there is a lot to learn from that world. One last question maybe. <coughs> Uh, I should ask my kids. <laughs> I haven't seen those apps, but perhaps maybe you can tell me what they are uh, after the talk. Oh, okay. Um, so there is actually a systematic review which was published, and I don't remember the exact details of it, which actually looked at these meditation and relaxation apps. Um, uh, and I think they had discovered it works and doesn't work in certain cases, but I don't remember the conclusion. But this is actually being looked actively um, a, by a, a community which is, what's the value of this? Because if they do work, they are fantastic potential intervention tools for many conditions. For example, anxiety would be, you know, uh, you, know you can say, if you're feeling anxious, if you could measure it, it is a, you should, you know, use that app right now. So it could be an intervention right in just in time, which could be very valuable. So there is definitely a community looking at it. All right. We'll thank uh, Shu again. Thank you. Thank you. Very much.